So I'm going to talk today um, a little bit about uh, journalism and, and bravery, which I think is something journalists kind of get. Um, sometimes journalism is dangerous, feels dangerous anyway, um, and you'll see a bit of that. Uh, um, and sometimes journalism is just very hard. It's very hard to, to, uh, to get the story. And I'm also going to talk a bit about journalism and brand marketing, which is something almost no journalists get. This is an industry which never thought you needed to do that. And I'm going to tell you a simple story about uh, the company I work for, the New York Times, and um, how we began in a particular circumstance to think about our own story and, and how to tell it. Um, so a bit of uh, uh, the backdrop. New York Times used to be uh, a newspaper for New York City. You kind of couldn't get it in New Jersey or on Long Island. It was for the city. We're now a pretty big global force in news, in opinion, in lifestyle, and in many other categories of content, and uh, in multiple languages. Um, one or two stats and uh, 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 facts and figures, uh, around 140 million uh, unique users every month, uh, a significant amount outside the US. Um, and uh, very unusual um, uh, for a legacy news organization, we're uh, a pretty profitable com company. We've got about a $1.6 billion turnover, 240 million uh, adjusted operating profit last year. Um, our thesis about journalism is that everything we do should be worth paying for, and we believe the future of, 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 of journalism is going to be a direct relationship with consumers who pay for quality journalism. Doesn't mean we don't want advertising. Uh, we think we've got a very valuable audience, and we think advertising can be a very valuable secondary stream of revenue, but we think the future is in a different, more intimate, more um, uh, understanding uh, relationship based on mutual trust with a deeply engaged audience. Um, and we've been building that. We have the very peak of the New York Times days as a physical newspaper. Uh, we had about a million subscribers. Uh, no million and a half subscribers, let's say. Today we have three and a half million. We still have a million print subscribers in the US, but we've got over a million, uh, over two million now uh, subscribers to our digital news product. And we have now other, we have a crossword product, a cooking product, about three and a half million um, in, in, in total. And we have those subscribers now uh, in countries all over the world. So what happened? Well, firstly, our digital revenue began to grow. Um, over the last five years, it's grown at around 11% a year. Uh, um, this means that by the time you get to 2017, that's about 600 million of digital revenue coming in, pure, pure play digital revenue. Um, we don't know of another news organization anywhere in the world which is driving that kind of revenue. And the key engine is building that engaged digital audience globally, serving them well, and getting better and better at getting them to convert to subscription. And then this happened. So I was in the New York Times newsroom on the night of the election. About 11 o'clock, I saw Dean Bacay, who's the editor of the, of the paper, uh, and of every digital expression of the Times on mobile and everything else. And uh, he had a piece of paper in his hand that had two words on it, Trump triumphs. Um, this was a, obviously, for many people, including the New York Times, an unexpected result. Uh, um, but then something else unexpected happened. Um, our audience, which was already, you can see, the blue line looks at the last US presidential cycle. This is a US audience. The global figures would show the same relationship. You can see that uh, the audience had grown enormously. Those are in millions, by the way. This is the US audience. The, the right hand, six, 60,000 means 60 million uh, unique users in a given month. It was already a much bigger audience. And critically, it grew massively through the election, but stayed and has to this day remained much, much higher than before the election started. But journalism itself became a central part of the story. A few days after the US election, um, Donald Trump started tweeting about the media and in particular about the New York Times. Now this is kind of, it, it's, it's, this is not normal. <laughs> uh, um, in so many ways, ladies and gentlemen, it, it, it's not normal for a president-elect to start um, uh, 
individually targeting news organisations and also um, specifically claiming, for example, that our audiences were collapsing, our subscriptions were, were falling. So essentially, untruths, to put it about as politely as you can, directly, without any checking or anything, straight out to the world. And the first one, which arrived at half past six in the morning, uh, on a Sunday morning, you know, by seven o'clock I'm on a conference call saying, well, what's the right response when the president-elect essentially tweets a stream of completely false statements about your company? And actually, it's a pretty obvious answer. I don't know quite why I took a conference call, which is you tweet back. And you say, it's not true. But over the, over the days that followed and, and, and the weeks and months that followed, it got pretty intense. Look at this one. The fake news media failing NY Times, NBC News, ABC, CBS is not my enemy. It's the enemy of the American people. This, this guy, uh, at this point, this is February, is president of the United States. <laughs> and at one level, you can see that this was, um, um, I'll show you some numbers later on, our, our subscriptions are uh, uh, building very nicely on the back of this, exactly the opposite of what uh, Uncle Donald is claiming is actually happening, which is that the, 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 everything is getting bigger and better in terms of the subscription department. Um, but although we were the absolute centre of attention, I also thought we were being increasingly defined by both attackers led by the president of the, of the country and defenders. Other people were telling our story and other people were defining our brand in different ways. And I asked the question, um, uh, we just, and you can see his face there, David Rubin, we'd, we'd, um, he's called head of audience and brand, we'd for the first, essentially the first time in the New York Times company's history, a few months earlier, hired a head of, head of brand marketing. And I asked him and a couple of other critical colleagues, uh, A.G. Salzberger, uh, currently deputy publisher soon, uh, uh, to be publisher of the New York Times, a member of the, the Ox Salzberger family, which is the family which is the controlling interest in the newspaper, and Meredith Copet Levy, and who's the chief operating officer. I said to them, you know, we don't have a big budget for brand marketing. We never had. What could you do if, we, if I gave you 10 million bucks to tell our story in our, own, in our own words? How would you do it? What would you say? And how big a splash could you make with it? And in a sense, that, that's my, my job as CEO, is to ask the question. Um, and uh, let me show you the answer they came, came, they came back with. The truth is, our nation is more divided than ever. The truth is, alternative facts are just the plain delusional. Is, the media needs to be The held truth is, we need to put the safety of the, the American people first. The truth is, refugee policy is a backdoor. The truth is, celebrities are out of touch with real The truth is, actors have a The truth is, a full investigation of many sides seeking to classify information is accurate. The truth is, the truth is, So that, that spot ran, um, we decided to run it on Oscars night uh, um, in the middle of it, and, and we blew probably a third of the 10 million in, in one <laughs> nice 30 second burn. Uh, um, um, but of course, it's a piece which is trying to say something, it's a clarion call, and it's trying to get noticed and picked up. It's a, this is a, almost like a kind of a, a detonator to try and get something bigger, bigger to happen. Um, and across New York, um, uh, in public spaces, in our physical paper, uh, um, um, with bits and pieces. And the, the important part of this photograph, yes, there are buttons and there are bags. Gloria Steinem, the great feminist, came into the New York Times for something entirely different and refused to leave without one of those bags. Um, we came up with pieces uh, uh, of artwork which our subscribers could stick in their windows. And that happened uh, uh, right across America. We have many, many uh, 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 subscribers to our physical paper who got these things and use them very effectively. Um, um, this is one comment from uh, 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 Victor Blackwell of CNN who said, it's not actually a defense of their reporting, it's just a defense of reporting. It's very important this. It was a bigger statement about the, the need for strong, independent journalism. And it wasn't saying we are the purveyors of truth. It was saying we try hard to get at the truth to help you understand what's really happening in your world. That was the idea behind it. Um, um, 
at the time, the final days when we were getting ready for the launch of this thing on Oscar night, literally the Friday before, um, uh, if you look to the, to the story on the right of this, this front page, um, there was a particular moment where uh, uh, the uh, president's uh, 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 colleagues decided to exclude a number of news organisations from, a, from a, um, a White House briefing. And this was one of the biggest days we've ever had for new digital subscription starts. So there was a kind of visceral reaction um, that if there was going to be an attempt to stop people understanding the truth, individual citizens had to be, had to be counted. Um, here's one example. This is, this is a, a young woman uh, in her 20s about why she became a digital subscriber, because you're doing a really great job. Also, getting banned from the West Wing office, fuck that. Um, and uh, that weekend, on the Saturday, this is a day before the, the official launch, though already the, the ad is, is kind of out there in various forms, uh, there was a demonstration. Um, it's kind of, I've never heard of this before. Several hundred people turned up to have a demonstration in favour of the truth outside our offices. That wasn't a kind of some clever PR activation. That just happened and came as a, you know, we all got phone calls and sort of rushed down to see it, but that's, that's what happened. Um, and we looked hard at how we could take this idea, and we're still playing with this about how we do this, to give it more meaning and to broaden its appeal. So let me show you another example of bravery. This is a, a, a um, part of the second wave uh, of ads we did in this campaign. Um, it's directed by, by Darren Aronofsky, um, and it's really about um, a different way in which the truth can be hard to get and the risks that you have to take to get it. We spent almost the entirety of the next 10 hours under fire. You know, our vehicle got progressively less drivable. Everybody was very focused, looking out the window. Uh, being outside of a vehicle is suicide. I heard somebody scream in Arabic, which means booby-trapped car. I felt the explosion directly in front of me. I've thought a lot about the person in that car. Um, I wish I could have talked to him to understand who he was. Trying to imagine that without anger or disgust is part of our job as journalists too. I'm Brian Denton, photojournalist for the New York Times. So the campaign ran, and here's one or two of the stats, it, it had an enormous impact. It was noted um, uh, 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 in almost every media outlet in the United States. And um, also more broadly, it was something which uh, news organisations around the world also picked up on. And there are many, many examples of other news organisations in other countries being inspired to launch their own version of this, this kind of campaign. Um, in practical terms, uh, these numbers look at um, uh, quarterly uh, ads of digital subscribers, so new digital subscribers. So you can see that, that in, in um, uh, the middle of this, which is sort of 2013, 2014, we are adding these, these names at the time, like perfectly good numbers, 23, 28, um, 33,000 subscribers uh, in a year. And if you want some benchmark, the the, the Times of London Sunday Times, who uh, had a subscription for long, uh, model for longer than we have, have got a total of 200,000 subscribers. So we were, we were actually we hit a million uh, 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 long before all this happened. But look at what happens. Um, it, the, the, the last blue bar is the run up to the election. It's the third quarter of 2016, 100, 116, which was the biggest number of digital ads since the very first quarter when the, the model launched. And then the last quarter of last year and the quarter after that, enormous numbers. So uh, the New York Times in three months is getting numbers bigger than, than um, D getting on for, uh, uh, in one case, as almost twice as big as, as, as pretty much any other complete model in the world. Um, but the spirit of the campaign is, is playing out in interesting ways. And, and um, this, this, this I, love, I love the photograph on the left. This, this is a photograph, it's tweeted out by Jody Cantor. Um, this is the moment of publication of the Harvey Weinstein story. 
the story on the right, so that group of people huddled there with their backs to us are, are the group of, of investigative reporters who reported out the Harvey Weinstein story, an extraordinary that we can talk about it, a very difficult story to, to get. And that's the moment they, they press the button. And I think because they're all over the newsroom, there's a button for the truth is hard in the foreground. Uh, and that group of journalists, Jodie's an a, a extraordinary journalist herself, but that Jodie and that team of journalists, I think, would absolutely say that, that this campaign sums up, because that was a very difficult story to get there. It, it sums up what they're doing. It's not just about Donald Trump. It's about what they all do. So just a few thoughts to end with. I asked my colleagues in brand marketing for their thoughts, which is um, our mission, what we really believe in, um, what we actually do, what our great journalists do, we think is the best place to start when we think about branding. Um, we thought it was worth trying to tell our own story in our own words rather than let ourselves be defined by everyone else. Um, all we have to do is show what the people who work for The Times do and make that clear to our wonderful, loyal readers and the thing takes off. And the last thing, which is may sound a bit trite, but... We're living in a moment of maximum disruption and safety is not the best option. Safety is dangerous. When, with a world which is changing this quickly, being brave, taking big risks, doing things where you don't know what the result's going to be, we believe is actually the safest way of proceeding. Thank you. a few minutes to ask Mark some questions if you'd like to take a seat. If you raise your hand, we'll get a microphone to you in a couple of minutes' time. Mark, as a journalist, uh, I'm all too aware how much news noise is out there, different um, sources of information, yeah. different people competing for your attention on different platforms, yeah. plus everyone has an opinion. Uh, to what extent uh, were you surprised at the response to your campaign commercially, that spike in subscriptions? Well, I think we're, we're, we're at a moment. I mean, in some ways, you could say in some countries still today, and in some points in our, in our own history, there hasn't been enough news. And there's been a dearth of information. Now, that's not our problem now. Our problem is this screaming noise. And also, I think the, the simple thing that's become very clear to us quite recently, rather late in the day, is there are plenty of bad actors. Mm. There are people who are trying to lie to us and trying to peddle false news, stories which are not true or which are distorted or they're, they're framed in a, in a deceitful way all the time. And I think, I think one of our lessons has been in that incredible noisy clutter, a clear, trustworthy signal is really valued. I mean, it's weird, at a time of maximum competition, in theory and news, there's almost no one who's doing independent, proper journalism about what's happening in the world. If you go to the world's press clubs, they're kind of deserted. Most of the legacy media guys pull back to save money, and the new, new guys are more interested in kind of entertainment news and other kinds of news than they are. There's a, there's a few. Vice has done some very good foreign reporting, for example. But generally, yeah. it's not a great thing for the digital guys. We've got 32 foreign bureau. We've still got them. We're still investing. We're still sending people to Iraq and other very difficult and dangerous spots to co cover what's happening. And I, I would say there's less competition for that kind of journalism than there used to be. The BBC's still there. Um, CNN is still there. There's a few, but but it's. I, I think this is a great moment. But I think the the there's been a kind of awakening, a public awakening. You cannot trust everything you hear. I mean, bluntly to put it politely, the the, the digital platforms, they're kind of neutral. Mm. If people like it, they show it, they distribute it. There's no real filter on any yeah. of that. The trouble is, uh, bad acting is obvious. You see bad <laughs> acting, you know it's yeah. bad acting. But you don't always know that a story isn't true. And we know that, for example, with Facebook uh, releasing figures about how many people in America saw at some point yeah. fake news. Yeah. And that probably with bad actors behind it. Not, not, I'm not suggesting Facebook 
knew they were doing it. That's just one example. But, 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 but I think that's a good example where actually that was a, a, an explicit, almost psycholo psychological operation, uh, operation military psycho psych psychological ops uh, campaign against American democracy. But I, I think that the, the, the role of news organizations where you can, you could, the provenance, I've, I've shown, you know, I'm here, I've shown you a list of faces. If you, if you think we've reported something wrong, you can find us, you can sue us, you can complain to us. You know, we, we take these complaints incredibly seriously. You can track us down. And, and so there's a kind of guarantee around the proven, provenance. I mean, I, I became a journalist partly because in my teens I got very focused on the Watergate story. And about two removes heard about what the New York Times and the Washington Post were doing to, to cover Richard Nixon. Mm. The incredible fa fact is four dec decades on, honestly, I mean, everyone does good work, but it's not, it's not Politico, it's not Huffington Post, it's not BuzzFeed. The New York Times and the Washington Post are still doing the best coverage of Donald Trump. Less has changed than people yeah, thought. And the Harvey Weinstein story may ha have that impact in decades to come. A story that the New York Times broke. Uh, one of the biggest stories of the year. It's had a ripple effect all over the world. And it we didn't know. We didn't know it was going to be that. I mean, we knew, we knew it was going to be a big story. Yeah. We didn't have any inkling mm. of how big it was going to be. But it was, it's one of those stories that will genuinely change the world we live in. What's interesting about the story is it, it's about two kinds of journalism. It's about real investigative craft. The, there was a breakthrough made in the, in the investigation of Bill O'Reilly um, uh, in relation to his, his the uh, allegations of, uh, of abuse and the settlements reached by him at Fox News. And the, the insight, very clever insight, because the problem with these stories is always the kind of he said, she said. Um, the victim is one voice, the, 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 the alleged or, or real um, uh, uh, perpetrator is another voice, is they found a way of tracking down settlements. They found a way of getting to a paper, paper trail to find out when settlements had been made, even though the settlements were meant to be entirely secure. And they, they were able to reverse engineer from the settlements to find victims uh, and with a great deal of clarity and the fact that money had been paid, which is obviously indicative of something yeah. interesting. Then a very different kind of journalism takes on, which you then have we're talking about bravery. Well, that's where we're related the to. The task yeah. of getting women who, for quite understandable reasons, have chosen to remain silent for months or years or decades to talk to, 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 to the journalists and ultimately in one or two incredibly brave early cases to go on the record. And this is a story, by the way, that other news organisations have been approached about but wouldn't touch it. Yeah. So in relation to our theme of bravery for the day, how will those brave decisions in relation well, to mean, that story the, the thing, and we're, individuals we're, we're all in. We're all, we're all in. I mean, we, we're trying to run a business here. Um, um, I mean, to state the obvious, um, Harvey Weinstein was, and the Weinstein Company, um, um, has been a very large advertiser with the New York Times. Uh, and by the way, the Times is regarded by most people, certainly its opinion pages, as being liberal. Um, Harvey Weinstein was a very well-known supporter of Hillary Clinton and support, supporter of other um, supposedly liberal causes, including, it must be said, support for many women's causes. That's part of part of the story. Was that this is not a this is not like Bill O'Reilly, a conservative. It was, it was a liberal. But we're all in. Um, if the story is there and it's in the public interest, no one puts up their hand saying, you know, so and so is really very powerful. You know, it could be really painful and difficult for the company, or we could lose some advertising revenue. That, that just doesn't happen. And I'm sure we miss stories. I mean, everyone misses stories sometimes. But, but I can't remember a single conversation with anyone on this or any other story at the time. I mean, the first thing uh, when I arrived, um, the very first thing was a, a piece of great investigative journalism about the outgoing prime minister of, of China, which has led, that was in 2012, that's led to us being blocked almost entirely in China for five years, that and a series of other 
other investigative stories about... I'd say that's brave. <laughs> we, we, uh, it, it, we, it's just, that's what you have to do. A round of applause for Mark Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.